Georgia, Georgia, Georgia. No peace I find, just an old sweet song. Keeps Georgia on my mind. The road leads back to you. I don't care where I go. I don't want to be any place but Augusta, Georgia. Two and a half hours from the ocean, two and a half hours from the mountains, two hours plus from Atlanta. We have lakes, we have a river. The quality of life is wonderful. So Keep Augusta Funky is a reference often to uh, James Brown. James Brown uh, grew up in the Augusta area and uh, has influenced the music scene around here greatly. They took some honey from a tree. They wrapped it up and they called it. My mom said that when I was born, my feet were moving first, and then I started singing, so. <laughs> when I last night, I didn't stay late. Nineteen people asked me for my name. Everybody's trying to be my baby. Everybody's trying to be my baby. Everybody's trying to be my baby. Trying to be my baby. Now, woo! I think God made all music, and I think that what I do, if I don't make people happy, I'm not gonna sing. I wanna see a smile on somebody's face, and I wanna see somebody moving when I, <laughs> when I sing. Don't be still, come on, you know, God gives you, yeah, look what he gives you, he gives you joy. And if you don't have that joy of the Lord in your soul, you, you're missing out on something, you're really missing out on something. I wouldn't tell people before, but I'm 89. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, people are living longer every day. <laughs> it's just so, oh, golly, I never thought I'd get to, to this age. And to be doing what I'm doing, you know. When we uh, came here in 52 in Augusta, Georgia, in my wonderful, wonderful Augusta, Georgia, uh, we started a television program that we were the first television program in Augusta, Georgia in 53. So when we went on the air with a show called Today in Dixie, we were on maybe till about 62 and Jim Neighbors came through and he needed a job. And, <laughs> and so he was there for about a year and a half. And so they wanted to sign me to a contract to go on The Tonight Show. And they had the contract and um, I brought the contract home and looked at it. And no, I would have had to left my home and gone on a circuit. They had a circuit planned for me that I don't know when I would have seen my girls again. Yeah, it wouldn't, they wouldn't, you know, that wasn't worth it to me. But you know what, Sharon, I must tell you, Augusta, Georgia has been so good to me. The people, I love them. There's no place like Augusta, Georgia. You know, when, when my records became, uh, um, you know, on the charts, pretty, pretty good on the charts, uh, I would go to Nashville to fanfare and sign in the booth, you know, sign my, my uh, records and things like that. And they were playing, playing them on all the major radio stations and all, out, in fact, when the Oklahoma bombing happened, which was years and years ago, uh, the children, you know, they were killed a lot of children with that Oklahoma bombing. And they played my song, Mama, Please Don't Cry, over and over on all the radio stations that morning. Mama, please don't cry, I'm with Jesus, you know? And um, it's just my heart, people have really touched my heart. People, if you're kind to people, and if you're, if you're what you are, and not try to be somebody else, people will love you. They can tell if you're real. They can tell if you're real. Augusta is, uh, it's having a revival. There's a lot going on here, in, including in downtown. And uh, 
there's a lot of people in the music here and, and, and buying records and we have people coming here from Atlanta and Athens and different cities just to buy the rare records. People that are into collecting records will go a lot farther than that. They'll go across the country if they have the time and money, you know, to find records they're looking for. Um, I, I've loved music since I was a kid. Um, started buying records, you know, when I was in elementary school. Um, used to go see every band I possibly could. And I, I'm just the right age that I saw all the, almost all the classic rock people, and starting in the late 60s and all through the 70s. It's like I, the first major artist I saw was Jimi Hendrix, and I saw him three times. And there's always been a nostalgia for vinyl because you have a record and you know, you got the big cover and a lot of times you have posters inside or they open up. You didn't get that with CDs. And uh, records are, are better to listen to, they're more fun to look at, they're more fun just to touch. You know, going through records is, is a relaxing thing. Going through CDs, you got click, clack, click, clack, and you got these little things, it just didn't seem right to me. I don't really carry a new vinyl, it's all original. And as far as what kind of music, I carry everything. I've, I've got a little, at least some of everything in here, but the main thing that people want is, is rock. Well, vinyl has been kind of sneaking back for a while and now it's back more than ever. And CDs have, are kind of officially over with. I just had the opportunity to travel with dad all around the world. I was doing his hair. <laughs> he needed somebody to do his hair. So I traveled with him and I did his hair. But I can tell you, sitting there rolling that hair, I listened to him as he was on the phone, talking to people, working his business, taking care of his things all over the world. And I can tell you that I went to college, I got degrees, but that was my best life's teaching is to see him at work, not necessarily on stage at work, but to see him at work and all of these things that had gone through, all of these things in his lifetime that he has seen, from coming from segregated South to now performing for kings and queens and prime ministers from all over the world, dining at the White House with presidents and entertaining for presidents. This was a poor black boy from South Carolina who was born in South Carolina and grew up in Augusta, Georgia. And so for my dad, he didn't come through a very easy life. And to him, education was number one because if, they get, if you get an education, that's something that someone can't take from you. And so it was very important to him that we, growing up in, in the James Brown household, that we got our education. The funeral started at one o'clock, and it was over at around six, five or six. So for those many hours, people tuned in who could not come. If they came and they couldn't get in because we were over capacity, they stood outside and watched on, they stood outside and they watched on TV monitor screens. In New York, People stood around the Apollo, I mean, wrapped around the Apollo blocks for hours just to get a glimpse of my father's body in a casket. Men and women on walkers, canes, 80, 85, 90 years old, because they grew up with his music. They grew up listening to him say, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. They grew up listening to him say, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door, I'll get it myself. They grew up listening to him sing, don't be a dropout. They grew up listening to him sing, it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman or a girl. These messages, they continue to tell their grandchildren. 
that lets me know that these messages are still giving gift and still giving life to people some generations after he even laid down the work. That is special. That is so special to me. How he talked to the masses after MLK passed away to calm everybody down, how he came right here to Augusta, Georgia, did the same thing after President Johnson had him on television to talk to the nation. He came to Augusta, he didn't forget about home. He came back home, walked, drove up and down Broad Street, walked up and down Broad Street talking to people, encouraging them to continue the nonviolence I can say that uh, I am proud to be his daughter. Uh, he was not a perfect man, but he was a good man. And the music that he left, the gift that God gave him, is still giving through the students of the James Brown Academy of Music Pupils. And I'm just proud. I'm just proud to be a part of this iconic history. <laughs> Augusta, Georgia has always probably been, in many years, has been a leader in what we now talk about as cyber. Um, we've had here in Augusta the Army Cyber Center of Excellence. We've had NSA, National Security Agency of Georgia, has been here for many years. But what the newness of what we're hearing and what we keep talking about is Army Cyber moving to Georgia. And with Army Cyber, that's a new mission for the state of Georgia. And uh, with that, it brings about 4,100 jobs with it. The federal government, meaning the Department of Defense, is gonna spend over $2.3 billion to transform Fort Gordon to prepare moving Fort Gordon from a signal mission to a cyber mission and to be prepared for when Army cyber moves here. So think about that, $2.3 billion investment in this state. Every day the men and women that are out at Fort Gordon are protecting you and me, all of our families, not just in Georgia, but across this country. I mean, they're there defending us, right? Um, it's just in a different way of a warfare, so to speak. Uh, and it's, a lot of times it's hard to understand because we don't see it, but it's, a, it's happening every day, 24 seven. You don't have to anymore put boots on the ground to be at war. Um, you can look at, I mean, every day, the, you know, there's just thousands, hundreds of thousands of attempts at somebody's grid. When we think about hacking, you hear about it all the time. Uh, So-and-so company just, you know, lost your information. But it really can be a lot more than that, to your point. It can be a power grid. It could be a water source. I mean, you could envision where somebody could go in and take over now that we are using uh, um, the Internet of Things to run our uh, street grids, right? Maybe it's your stoplights, etc. I mean, think about that. We use this word a lot or this phrase that it's transformational or it's a game changer. We say that a lot, but this truly is. I mean, a $2.3 billion investment by the federal government. And it's not just that the state is spending $100 million here to build a, a, a building, a set of buildings. It's the mission that brings to Augusta. But those that are moving in, it is a younger person's work field. That doesn't mean you don't have people my age in this industry, but it really is a young person's field and the opportunities are incredible. And with that, 
is what do they like? Well, it's not what I grew up with where everybody wanted a big house with a big yard. Their footprint, most of them want a smaller footprint. They want to be creative. They want to do something that makes a difference. And when you get a couple of thousand people that think like that, it changes your community and it changes what you see. I'd always had a dream of owning a vintage clothing store, and my husband and I own the building and we live upstairs. So we worked out a deal and I started out with a vintage business and then the opportunity presented itself for me to buy the costumes that used to be at Fat Man's Forest, which was a business here for 50 years. And the two just work beautifully together. So I'm doing an event um, actually in, in a few weeks and I do it every year and it's called Wet Paint. And we do it over at Sacred Heart, which is a huge church that was restored. And I, it's a theme tonight. And this year our theme is iconic musicians and I'm dressing all of my models as iconic musicians and they'll be doing mannequin modeling around the room. You know, it's a different way. When people kind of get out of their element, put a, put a costume on, they can let their hair down and be a little bit more fun. So I always say it, it, it's more fun in a costume. I swore I'd never come back, but uh, things changed. I moved home and it was the best thing I ever did. But I've never left Georgia and never will. Augusta, Georgia is located on the Savannah River. Um, just across the way is South Carolina. We can actually see it from here. Uh, the Savannah River divides the two states. Also home to the uh, Masters Golf Tournament. That's what Augusta is really known for. All right, so today we're gonna be paddling out to Stallings Island. It's a, uh, the Stallings region is a uh, mile stretch just above the head gates of the Augusta Canal and the fall line of the Savannah River. Um, in this mile stretch, you're eventually dead-ended by uh, the Stevens Creek Dam, uh, but it's a really interesting area. Of course, Stallings Island, uh, a lot of people know that there are wild donkeys and goats that have been placed on the island in the mid-90s. I wonder if I need to peel it. I've never given them an orange. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. A smaller bite. <laughs> See what I mean? They get kind of close and personal. This one big rock right here behind me is actually a little spot we call Whale Rock. It looks like a whale coming out of the water. It's a fun little spot to stop and swim at. But uh, it's a really cool area. We can get real close up to the dam. It feels real cool having that cold water running down the rock. So when I started my, my company in 2011, there was really only one or two other kayak companies that were open at the time. And um, it was just kind of something that a few, uh, I guess we'll call them pioneers, were you know, trying to turn Augusta into. Um, but it was, it was uh, slow growing and some of those companies went out of business. And now there's like six or seven of us kayak vendors.
So disc golf is a sport that's played much like tradi traditional golf. Uh, obviously, instead of balls and clubs, we use discs and baskets. Uh, the object of the game is to throw the disc from the tee pad into the basket in as few amount of throws as possible, uh, and you will achieve a score. Uh, just like ball golf, we try to shoot as low as we can. Back in the mid-70s out in California, a gentleman named Ed Hedrick uh, was responsible for creating the first disc golf pole hole, which is the target that we aim at. Uh, and at that time, prior to then, was when everybody was throwing at light posts and you know mailboxes, things like that. So once the target pole hole was created, um, disc golf kind of took off. Um, nowadays, the Professional Disc Golf Association sanctions over 3,500 tournaments a year. Um, so obviously it has grown quite quickly in the 40 year span. Uh, discs are made to do different things. And you can see some of them are a little bit more beveled on the side, tapering off. This would be a putter. So they're meant to go more up and down, uh, thrown from short distances and finish in the basket. This is a mid-range disc. You can see it's a little less beveled, a little bit more aerodynamic here. Uh, and these are made to, they're kind of like our wedges. If you're talking about ball golf, uh, this is how we get it closer to the hole, uh, lay it up so that we can make a putt and have it fall in the basket. So these are kind of like our, you know, our drivers and our three woods, if you will. Disc golf is huge in Augusta, actually. We've hosted uh, three world championships now, um, just over the river in North Augusta. Uh, we host the National Collegiate Disc Golf Championship once a year, and so, you know, the, the um, sport itself actually developed uh, in the early 90s in Augusta, and um, a few courses were put in locally around town. Um, we're very lucky here to be saturated with the number of disc golf courses that we are, about 17 uh, within a 30-mile radius, which is, huge. Well, you know, a lot of people know Augusta for another golf course. Uh, obviously, the Augusta National is just around the corner from us, and with such a rich ball golf tradition, uh, it seems to make sense that, that this golf would follow in those footsteps. The whole happy thing started basically in, in the broadest terms, it came to begin, I believe it was uh, 2012, it was an election cycle, and um, there's a whole lot of unhappiness out there, people being, you know, snide comments and, and hate on both sides of, of everything, and it, I was like, you know, I, I work in advertising, if I could advertise or, or condense one message down, with all these posters people are putting out on the side of the road and little signs, if I could put something out there, what would it be? What would be my one, one, um, one word? If I could continue, continue to one word, it would be happy. Then I kind of thought, you know, if, I, if I'm going to use my graphic design powers for good, what will I do? And what else can I do? And so I thought buttons are inexpensive. I could make a whole bunch of those and just leave them around downtown. And um, so I did. And then I would leave them at restaurants or cash registers or when I left a tip. People get ticked off when you tell them to smile, but if you remind them of a feeling or a mood happy, then usually that will do the smile for you. And then smiles are contagious. So if you can get one person to smile, they'll smile at the next person and it just keeps on going. And so that way you can kind of spread a mood that way uh, just by one word and one smiling robot. <laughs> I'm kind of known in town for drawing robots and just because a robot can be anybody, any gender, any race, any age, anybody. I lost a partner in 2006 and so usually when I draw the robots, I try to show them together. Even, you know, I, the world is full of, to, I call it just happy sad because you can't have one without the other. They're always, they're always in equal amounts or sometimes, you know, 75, 25, but the, the happy sadness, you can't have one without the other. And you can't appreciate the happy until you felt the sad. That You don't know how good this is until you felt this. I mean, he was so funny and just he is constantly laughing with him. And I mean, who, who wouldn't want that in their life? And then um, uh, to condense the story down, in 2006, he um, uh, cryptococcal meningitis. 
uh, the fungal version of meningitis and after 10 weeks in the hospital he passed away and at that point I kind of was faced with what do I do so for about a year and a half I tried to stay in Atlanta but I I completely just fell apart and lost it um, and then I moved back here to Augusta Thank you. Again, I was just like, you know, if the crap I've lived through could help anybody, then it kind of make me living through that crap a lot more worth it. So why not? If I have to sit in front of a camera for 15, 20 minutes and retell that story, why not? And um, then there was a movie. <laughs> so knowing people know your story is a little weird sometimes so if anybody ever says hey can i make a movie about you think about it so i'm totally going to quote rem right now but everybody hurts and even even you know i'm considered the happy guy people on the street will yell at me and just say hey happy i love that but you know i'm there, there's I, I still hurt a lot and I, you know I, I go through bouts of depression and everything but but the one thing I do know is that life is like a roller coaster, and if you go down, you are guaranteed to come back up. Making me I just